It's time to unveil the latest new signing here at AFC Bournemouth. Hello and welcome to the debut episode of the official AFC Bournemouth podcast. This is where we're hoping to give you a unique insight into life here at the Vitality Stadium and beyond. I'm Chris Temple. I've been covering the Cherries since 2002, commentating with Big Willow for BBC Radio Solent. Everyone at the club is very excited to be part of this new podcast, none more so than my co-host, the one and only Mr Neil Perrett, who of course for decades worked for the Daily Echo in Bournemouth now part of the club's media team here. One of the broadcast gurus, in fact, Neil, which is why we've specifically got you involved in this podcast. Are you excited, first of all? Absolutely. Can't wait, Chris. Can't joined by a fantastic guest as well. 2002, Chris, that's a relative novice, I think. I started covering the club in, what, 1995? Seen so many ups and downs, lots of downs to start with, lots of fantastic ups in the last few years. It's been a, it's been a fantastic journey and great to see see it from both sides of the fence now as well. And if we told you you were going to be involved in a podcast as somebody, and you, know, you and me have had our battles down the years, you know, broadcast against written press, but you're here, here as part of a broadcast. You're leading this, Neil. Chris, I had to look up podcasts to see what it meant just before we did this. I had never heard of them before, but no, that's not strictly true. It was listicles and things like that when we were in the newspaper business. But yes, if you'd have said to me 10, you know, even two, three years ago that I'd be sitting here now um, in your illustrious company, Chris. Oh, stop it, Neil. <laughs> then, uh, you know, you, they would have had to take me away, Chris. Just about got himself back uh, back on level terms there. OK, there's plenty of games, of course, at the moment and loads of action to contend with in this busy championship season. So initially, we're going to be releasing this podcast around about once a month, but hopefully it will bring you, uh, we'll bring it to you more regularly as the season progresses. We'll be sharing some of the stories of our combined 50 years, we reckon, of covering the club. Some special guests to give you a great lesson coming up as well. So whether you've been a cherry for maybe 50 plus years, back to the Ted McDougall days and beyond, or you're a junior cherry recently, Certainly joining the Bournemouth journey, hopefully something for you. Now, Neil, just before we introduce our very special guest, who we're delighted to have on this debut episode, um, interviewing, of course, is the main part of podcasting and the main part of why we're here. We've done, I mean, probably hundreds down the years, maybe thousands, I reckon, in your case. Then always go to plan, though. Do they got any immediate sort of horror stories from interviews down the years? Well, every Friday morning, we used to carry out our pre-match press conference at Canford School in the old days when um, Sean O'Driscoll was the manager and... Sean, on this particular Friday morning, had forgotten that we were doing the press conference and he was miles away setting out some cones on a pitch. I know that you were there that day as well. So you and I traipsed off um, across about four or five football pitches. You know, I was well out of breath by the time I got there. And uh, <laughs> you obviously led the questions with Sean. You asked him one or two questions and he, and he gave you one word answers. And I remember the third question was something along the lines of, Sean, you know you don't have to do this if you don't want to. And he looked at you and said, all right, I won't then, and walked off. <laughs> and stomped off across the Canford training pitches. Our guest is uh, smiling in the background because he was part of that uh, short just go resume. And I'm sure that resonates a little bit with him as well. But I think Sean, yeah, I mean, Sean interviewing wasn't Sean's favourite uh, favorite topic, was it? OK, let's uh, waste no further time and get on and introduce our very special guest for this official AFC Bournemouth podcast. He played 185 games for the club over two spells and six years. He was a full Scotland international and he's now the technical director here at the club. It's a very warm welcome to Richard Hughes. Oh, thank you very much, Chris. Privileged to be your first guest. I was going to say, are you feeling the heat of being the first guest? Well, at least I'm, I'm glad, unlike Sean, I've turned up, today, which, is a, <laughs> which is a good start. Uh, I mean, you'll, that will resonate with you, won't you, that Sean was sometimes the communication issue, particularly with the media, wasn't his favourite? Yeah, I mean, he was a good communicator with the players, more importantly. I think um, we, we always knew what he wanted. We always knew how he wanted to play. So I guess you guys got a, a rougher ride than we did. <laughs> um, OK, let's let's start straight away with, with your job, shall we? Technical director. Um, what does the technical director do for those who maybe don't haven't, aren't completely aware of your role here? Well, it changes club to club. Um, at this particular club, essentially, it's heading up the recruitment department. Um, so working alongside management and, uh, and liaising with Neil Blake in terms of squad planning, squad structure. Um, but but the, the main job is to, to head up the recruitment department and, uh, and oversee that and, and, and sort of educate the scouts into what the manager is looking for and, and what the club are looking to, to recruit. I know there's obviously been some changes recently related to the change of division, but when you say recruitment department, just give us an insight into what that entails here. Sure. So we've got, I think when I um, started doing this, when I just stepped off the training ground, I think we had about five scouts, four to five scouts, of course, Steve Fletcher was one of them. Um, and, and more recently now, I think we've got eight scouts, one based abroad. Um, so that's it, a chief scout in there as well, head of domestic scouting, which is Andy Howe, um, Eddie's nephew. 
and um yeah that that's that's pretty much it and and we're, we're not the biggest recruitment department in the country definitely went in the premier league um we've we've cut our cloth accordingly post covid post relegation um but we're competitive and, and we hopefully do a good job for the club we're here recording this uh, you know in the morning of a you know a weekday the day before a game for example if you weren't sat here with us at the moment what what would you what would you be doing what would a recruitment technical director be doing right now well it, no two days are the same i think you just find me stepped out of the the, the transfer window and th those are pretty stressful days because even though it's a, a transfer window we had where we only recruited two players. Every day is picking up the phone to agents, is speaking to people you don't necessarily want to speak to on a daily basis. Um, but what would I be doing today when the season is sort of uh, fully underway and the, and, and the window's closed? Um, probably having meetings of some description, a Zoom meeting in, the, in this day and age, as everyone's used to, and um, and just planning for, for, for the subsequent window and, and, and planning. It starts 10 weeks, three months, out because you can't just wake up one day and, and sign a player. Um, so, so those are the main sort of daily interactions I have. If I'm looking at a player, of course, because the scouts will bring players to, to my attention and before they go in front of the manager, then I obviously have to cast my eye. So something like that, I think, Chris. It's, but, but no two days are the same. It's pretty flexible. We'll come on to we'll come on to the uh, the specifics of the window just gone very shortly. But interesting, you mentioned Zoom there and and how that has changed. I guess everybody's landscape. How has it impacted the, the whole COVID situation with the work that you do? And and ha can you have transfer negotiations over Zoom realistically? We well, kind of have to. Yeah, I mean, it, they they did happen. Um, you don't doesn't necessarily have to be always on Zoom. You can you can pick up the phone, of course, and and, and do it that way because you don't have to necessarily see each other the whole time. You're having a negotiation, but. Um, I think because we, we had a relatively quiet um, uh, window from an incoming perspective, um, I think that would that helped to sort of bed into the, the, the new uh, the new way of, of recruiting, as it were, post-COVID. If we'd had a window where we were signing six or seven players, I think it would have been very challenging. Um, but, but um, yeah, the, the, the main differences are in terms of uh, into what the plan is and what the structure is. And, of course, we have to cut our cloth accordingly. And, and, and most clubs up and down the country have been quieter, I think, in this window. I think the stats are there to prove it, that there has not been a lot of, of action compared to, to previous windows. Um, but I think it's it, there's something quite good about actually not having to travel to have a meeting and just picking up a phone and having a, a Zoom chat. <laughs> I've got to say, just before Neil comes in, Jason Tindall's is, uh, press conference is at 8.30 in the morning now. I've got to say, not having to travel to the ground for those and just rolling down to my front room is a lot better than uh, having to travel to the stadium for them. I can tell you that. Can Half imagine. an hour in bed. J just ask you about um, our most recent signing, Cameron Carter-Vickers. Now, um, it's not a case of just... Oh, we need a defender uh, who's around. There's a lot of work. There's lots of lists and, and stuff like that. How does that work with your department? Yeah, good question, Neil. And, and, and no two signings are the same. Um, we came into this window not necessarily knowing what we needed from an, uh, an incoming point of view because uh, a lot depended on, on who we kept. Um, and that's clearly out with uh, the, recruit, uh, the recruitment department's uh, control. Um, we just needed to be prepared and have names in, in positions just in case. So we had uh, extensive lists, as you allude to there, in, in that regard. Um, also, um, during the course of pre-season, Jason changed the, the formation that, that, that he used or that, that he has started a season with. So um, suddenly from sort of having centre-backs and playing in, in the back four, you're, you're therefore having to be a little bit more extensive and, and finding players that can play in the back three. I think you also have to um, be reactive in, in this side. You can have all the best plans you want. You can all have all the best preparations or think you're, you're well prepared, but you have to be reactive. And um, in Cameron's case, of course, we, we had a, a new member of the coaching department who'd, uh, who'd managed Cameron um, at Luton. Uh, so clearly the input coming the other way, it's not all one-sided input like uh, Scouts and, and myself giving opinions to to the manager it comes the, the feedback comes the other way as well perhaps more at, at this level i think at, at the premier league level than uh, when eddie and jason were, were sort of uh, facing opponents um you know nine times out of ten household names international stars it wasn't uncommon that they would come back wanting to to recruit players that that we couldn't obviously um, but at championship level i think that it will happen um, as the season goes on that they'll like players that they play against and that, that impress them so we have to be reactive to that as well um, so more, more pressingly for Cameron's situation, it was a, an 11th hour, probably a 12th hour signing. Uh, I think we had 45 minutes. So I don't know how Alice Jeans, the club secretary, managed to get all the paperwork done in time. Um, but it was uh, clearly that was in a, um, a, a reactive signing to Joe Roden having joined uh, Tottenham so, so late notice. So again, it, you, can, you can go a whole day without um, making a meaningful phone call in, in this job. And then suddenly it's, it's all systems go. And that, that was the case on, on transfer deadline there. So Cameron was obviously a loan signing. Just 
just going to maybe a permanent signing, a signing perhaps that's going to cost quite a lot of money. What, how does the procedure work involving the owner, the chief executive, the manager, you? Do you all sit around a table and say, well, we're going to have to pay X for so-and-so? And who sort of would, would make the final decision, if you like? Because there's a lot, of, a lot of talk to go on internally. Yeah, and it, again, a very good question and, and one that I'll try and answer as succinctly as possible. But it's um, it, it, sort of in that question, you have a microcosm about how recruitment can go wrong. Um, and, and the good fortune that we've had at this club is consistency. Um, because I think if one of those components change, let alone a couple of them, um, like it has happened, that uh, happens all the time at clubs up and down the country, um, then clearly that there can be a disjointed nature to 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 the recruitment, and it's it's not easy to get. Um, there's no guarantees, rather to get signings right, um, but clearly you can uh, you can limit the chance of mistake with good communication. And we've always had that. We've we've always um, I say we've always had that. We've had that in this in this era of the club, um, because I wouldn't know what happened before, to be honest, Neil. And how I was signed for this football club and on two occasions is is a mystery, but. Uh, um, from a, from from this side of the fence, um, directive is clear from the owner. The communication between the owner and the, and the chief executive Neil Blake um, is is excellent. Um, I'd imagine on a daily basis, especially during a, um, a transfer window, uh, and you come into it with um, uh, with with a plan. You kind of you kind of in in, in windows gone by, summer windows especially, we've always looked to uh, to be progressive to to improve um, the, the squad that we had, which was. As well as a, a want, it was a necessity as well because we had a a very good team here. Um, of course, a great team that, that achieved promotion, won the championship title um, with a group of players that, without having the average age to hand, was probably the wrong side of 25. Um, so to to survive five years in in the Premier League, you know you're going to have to recruit in order to do that. Um, and uh, every window there was an understanding um, that would have come from the manager uh, primarily. His 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 belief so so Eddie Howe would have had uh, first and, and last word on a signing but clearly in between that first and last word there's a whole uh, a whole load of process of important conversations going on with people of the level you um, you describe their owner chief executive etc um, but there was always a great understanding and a belief in um, where the message was coming from the fact that the message in the first place was an accurate one and therefore the the owner always wanted to um, and always has uh, back that uh, and uh, and allow the chief executive to 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 negotiate said deal, and uh, and hopefully come out of the transfer window with a uh, with a more competitive squad than we went into it with. Um, clearly, when you come down the level, and this is the first time I've been um, in this job that that's happened. Um, and uh, of course, it wasn't the plan to ever be in that situation, but um, we had to be reactive to it. You, you chuck COVID into the mix, and it makes it a situation where. You have to be, uh, you have to be careful. You have to be prudent. We knew that certain players would go. We didn't know exactly how many, so therefore the list that uh, the recruitment department had to have were pretty extensive. Um, we, I think, we having lost three players to to sales and then uh, a, a number in terms of out of contract and and uh, Harry Wilson, of course, the long going back. I think uh, probably eight or nine bodies uh, short than we were last season. Uh, but the belief um, from everyone coming into the window um, that if that was the number that, that we lost, it probably would only take one or two and uh, and a little bit more luck on the injury front to have a, a more than competitive squad to, to attack the championship with. So it's it's evolving conversations. I'm, I'm going on a lot here, Neil, but it's, you've asked me a very, very relevant question to the, the process and, and I want to give a, a, an accurate answer. But fundamentally, the key to having a... A good recruitment or as good recruitment as possible is good communication from the leader down and, and we definitely have that here people want to hear from you richard they don't really want to hear from me or chris Lanka. <laughs> just 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 a quick one um it's quite topical at the moment i'm not going to talk about other clubs businesses but sometimes there can be um disputes between technical directors and managers um what's it like for you to a eddie howe and then jason tyndall ex-teammates what's it like to have worked and be working with them how how important is it that relationship yeah fundamental I, i'm very lucky that um the only two managers i've had doing this are, are two people that i've known since uh, since my teens um and understanding them uh, from a human perspective as well as a footballing perspective i think it is crucial to the job that i do and i really i feel sorry for <laughs> for people in my role that um that try and do that will do do this and a very good job in, in, in times as well for people that they don't necessarily know um, as well as I do 
Um, it, it clearly, that proves that it's not essential, but it, it gave me a head start definitely in uh, um, working under, uh, uh, alongside a manager as, as, as successful as Eddie also helps because he can make um, uh, bad decisions look indifferent and uh, decent decisions look great. Um, so, um, you know, that, that I think is the key. I think um, how you recruit a player, it clearly varies between club and club and everyone will have their own policy. Um, it, it's my belief that the best chance you have of having a, a successful signing is that the manager is a huge part in, in that recruitment process, which we've always had. Um, but it's also true that that manager can't be in multiple places at one time. So therefore, if Jason is preparing for the game um, um, tomorrow um, and tonight, it's unlikely that he will manage to cover the six or seven championship games that are going on. And that's why it's someone else's uh, job to make sure that that's done properly. So, so that for me is, is what the job is. And, and the better the understanding between the person in my shoes and the person picking the team and coaching the players, um, then it would one would assume that the better the chance for, for success. It, 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 it buys no guarantee because the, the magic question you want answered is how is that player going to do at this club with these teammates, at, uh, this manager in front of these fans at that time? An impossible question to, to, to ask fully. Um, so you're in the, in the lap of the gods a lot of the time. But if you narrow down um, the, the chances of mistake by doing your homework correctly and making sure that you need uh, that position clearly in the first place, then then there's all sorts of things that you can do to to, to limit the mistakes and uh, and ensure that there are, that are more good six signings than bad ones. Let's just stay on the recruitment theme just for a moment. Um, Lots of people are fascinated with how transfers happen. Um, there's, you know, all sorts of reports about, you know, there were reports in this window about exes that agreed terms with this club before they've the clubs have agreed fees, etc. Take us inside a transfer deal, Richard, from your point of view. Pretend I'm Neil Perrett's agent. Neil is under contract at another club. He's obviously got multiple agents, a man of his ability, um, and you want to sign him. What happens first? You know, somebody, if it's all done, everything's done above board, of course, by all the clubs doing it right. What happens first in terms of this player's not a free transfer, he's under contract somewhere else, you want to sign him. What's the first approach? you make and, and how does it move from there to potentially getting the signature on the paper uh, this is the point where i should tell you we approach the the football club and make uh, uh yes. do things so, yeah you want you want the official you want me holding in front of the fa um, <laughs> not really okay um no i think um it, it's uh, uh no clearly once you've once you've narrowed down onto what target you um want to recruit um that there are there are various conversations that need to take place then now clearly um the most important there's, there's three parties to it the selling club buying club and uh, and, and player um, you don't have an agreement unless you have the yes from all three um, now it is um, I think most clubs accept that there is a level of conversation with uh, representatives throughout the course of the year which will help you identify what players uh, situations may be um, it's not point being blind to that that that's happens otherwise there would be a, a, a whole um, segment of months out with the transfer window where people will be doing nothing um, so conversations are taking place um, with agents and, uh, and and they're telling us the, the situation that their clients uh, uh, may face in the next uh, coming windows um, f fundamentally you have to agree a fee with um, with uh, the third party with the, the club and uh, that's the selling and that can that can change drastically between uh, different situations um, you know and I, 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 honestly I would say that no uh, two signings have ever been the same, um, and um, it, it all, we we all know even when a player's coming for us, we all know that obviously if a club's knocking on our door to buy a player, there's a good chance that the player might want to go there as well. I think that's uh, uh, also part of the uh, part of what's taken as a given during the process, um, and uh, and then negotiating the, the 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 transfer fee is something that uh, um, at this football club is um, is uh, the responsibility of Neil Blake, chief executive. Um, so he will touch base with his counterpart or, or, or whoever is in charge at, at the other club, and and they will try and they will try and do a deal. Then, when um, given the green light to do so, it's um, it, it's therefore the process where Neil and myself will will speak with the agent. Chances are that I've been speaking to the agent uh, in in the months uh, leading up to it about any number of things, and uh, and they're uh, we're trying to reach a deal with with the player. So so those those are just. I don't want to. I'm trivialising those aspects. So those are aspects that you want to know how, yeah. and, and they're all they're all different. Some of them are very straightforward and very easy. Sometimes you, if my information I've gathered for the chief executive in between windows is accurate, then the process uh, process is, is a lot smoother. Um, if it's not, then then there can be uh, some eleventh hour work 
in terms of uh, frontingly trying to achieve a deal. But I think I think what we've always tried to do here is to, uh, barring a couple of isolated incidents, uh, I, I think we've always tried to do the work early uh, and give ourselves enough time um, so that we're not sc- uh, frantically um, scrambling around for a, a last minute medical. Um, and with that comes all the things that we said before about the, the good communication, the identification being the accurate one. Um, and again, having had uh, well, a lot of experience working on the ready and in a couple of situations working on the Jason where there's a clear remit makes it a lot easier for me to sort of not have a list of five or six um, players because then you end up spinning plates, which is uh, uh, part of the job, which everyone in my position will refer to in terms of spinning a plate. And you can imagine what that means. It's like you, you having to uh, sort of uh, play keen on a number of uh, fronts when actually you, you want plan A to come in. And, uh, and probably it's because I'm such an, a morally uh, sound and honest person. I don't like to spin the other plates. I like to, you know, for us to be successful with plan A. And, and, and a lot of time, because of the backing we've had from uh, from above the, the technical side of things, then uh, we've been fortunate with that. I want you to just finally, before Neil comes in, um, on transfers, Willow always talks to my commentary partner about the Harry Redknapp days when they'd say, right, get them straight down the beach. Any new signings potentially, go and show them the beach, go and show them the seafront and they'll sign, forget anything else. Of course, in this COVID world we're talking about, you presumably can't do things like bring people down, have a look around before you sign them. No, we, we can't, but we were um, it, taking a leaf out of Harry and, uh, <laughs> and Willow's book there. It was uh, something in terms of, uh, you, you play your trump cards when, you, when you're recruiting and... Um, um, and the ones that we've had, um, again, sorry to harp on historically, but we're only two signings uh, deep in this, in this new era. But um, clearly on a revolution uh, from um, where we came from to Premier League um, was a well-documented story. And it was a story that people out with um, the town um, perhaps didn't know a lot of the time. And you're educating people on that front. It's a really good story. And, and we told it. Um, and the people that, that play the part in that story... Um, as, as well as the fans, of course, um, you know, in, in principally was was Eddie. So he's your trump card, and you go into into that negotiation saying we've got the brightest young uh, English manager uh, in the country, and uh, you wouldn't have anyone disagree with that. So suddenly, again, it makes my job easier. Um, and then, um, not far behind Eddie is the beauty of the <laughs> of the, the local area, and, uh, and and that's again that's what we we we, we played that card every every time we could um not so much as organizing meetings according to weather forecasts or anything but it, <laughs> it was uh um we, we then we then um uh, developed uh, uh recruitment videos um which um uh, surprised they're not actually entered other people's circulation now because you send them out by email you never know where they go but in those emails we try to um uh, split it into three videos the history of the club um the the, the coaching and the technical side of things and, and that's where we'd feature heavily on the on management and uh, and coaching staff and uh, the development of players, which is something that we um, pride ourselves on doing, um, and then of course um, a, a separate video for for the location, just uh, educating people that may never have been to Bournemouth, may never have heard of Bournemouth in certain cases, and uh, and and those videos sort of um, packed it up and and either show them in person if if um, situation allowed or we hadn't managed to uh, to show the individuals via their agents uh, in previous um, situations but that is a big part of it because you, you have to play your, your trump cards and especially when we were in the premier league and um not being disrespectful to ourselves but if you're going to go try and fight off um the top teams in the country for a lloyd kelly for example you're not going to be able to show the the, the trophy cabinet or the, the amount of champions leagues you've won um but you may uh, focus on uh, geography to, to an extent um but in, in, in the case of coaching and development of players and pathway. Um, so, so those we, we try to show in person if we could, but we had the video there to, to help us along where we couldn't. You forgetting the 1990, 1984 Football League trophy we won? <laughs> oh, no, not at all, no, no, not at all. What was that against Neil? <laughs> <laughs> it was in Hull City, I believe. And Sean O'Driscoll tells a story about it. it was so dark that night when they were getting the medals, they were being thrown at them by Graham Taylor or whoever it was. Um, just moving on to the role the role of a, certainly a domestic scout, Richard. I was at an under-18 game last season, standing with our scout there, and we were playing Plymouth. And he had the most incredible knowledge about Plymouth Argyle under-18s. And I said, how on earth do you know so much about that team? And he said, well, it's one of my teams. And he sort of explained how he's detailed to cover a certain amount of 
clubs in the country. Just explain what, how that works. Well, tell me who it was, and we'll make sure we get him fired for <laughs> letting on their trade secrets to uh, excellent broadcasters like yourself, Neil. Um, so yeah, so so in in what we try to do, and again, the the the, the scouting um, the scouting uh, pathway situation is something that has evolved in my five or six years that I've been here. Uh, always searching for um, the best outcome, um, and always knowing that in five or six years you're not going to have reached there, so you're going to have to constantly evolve and add layers to it, and that's something that we've done uh, as we've as we've gone on. And it became apparent to me in, after a couple of years of doing this that. Uh, it was what what uh, is who you didn't sign that was as important as who you did, and uh, and there was often situations where Eddie would ask me about a player, uh, and it wasn't good enough for me to know to tell him I didn't know who it was just because we were focusing on someone we preferred. I thought there was, there had to be an accountability and responsibility um, from me in the department to give Eddie an answer to that question, and the only way, or well, the best way we found of doing it is that all other ninety one teams in in the football league and Premier League would accounted for from a uh, from a scouting perspective and um essentially it's like a, a man marking system if you like of the the scouting um uh the scouting process rather than sort of zonally marking and saying well, who's who's missed that kid that's uh, tearing up trees at accrington it's like at least you can turn around and actually look the person in the eye who's missed that that player at accrington if that situation arose um, which i'm sure it doesn't because that's the next process of man mark them and man mark them properly um, and uh, and and everyone that we've had is uh, has always been very committed into to that level of detail that that uh, um, that you say. So it, it probably ended up um, between fifteen and twenty three uh, teams apiece, depending on 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 what scout um, was apportioned to Plymouth. I have to go back and look at who that was. <laughs> and uh, and uh, yeah, so 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 they would have had fifteen to twenty three teams, and then clearly. Um, it, it takes a number of weeks to get through all 23 teams because you have to be accountable to all of them. And then once you've done that, there's no point watching um, Plymouth's first team uh, 10 times if if you pretty much know everyone that, that's in Plymouth's first team. So then coming down the levels and watching younger age groups and uh, 23s and then 18s is, is something that we, we've always encouraged the, uh, the guys to do to be as accountable as possible because, I mean, Lloyd Kelly is an interesting example of this. I don't necessarily like to mention examples um, individually, but it is a relevant one uh, where Lloyd Kelly, it wasn't just his appearances for England under 21 and, and Bristol City's first team that, that where we had scouted him, there was a body of work that had gone into him and his younger age groups and in Bristol uh, Bristol City's under age groups, which, which gives you um, the ability to act quicker, I think. So when Lloyd comes on, for example, and does really well in one championship game, um, you, you kind of know that that was always going to happen if you've looked at him beforehand. So um, that, that's what we, we, we try to do. We haven't evolved that process too much from them because uh, accounting for all 91 other teams is uh, uh, is hard enough in itself to do. Um, but uh, yeah, so does that answer your question, Neil, in terms so of the... certainly does. The next one is the International Scout. 20 years mm. ago, our International Scouts would have covered the Isle of Wight, signing people like Sean Cooper, maybe the Channel Islands, Brett Pittman, but you've obviously cast your net a lot wider now just tell us about the role of the international scout so again that, that came came about because of the accountability and uh, and uh, as it won't be surprising to you uh, that, because you know Eddie Howe so well it, it's every department wants to improve and impress essentially and uh, and when we um, got promoted to the Premier League uh, again e even though perhaps we wouldn't necessarily have delved into the foreign markets um, too often or too soon we still needed to tell uh, Eddie, who N'Golo Kante was, who was signing for, for Leicester City because on match day three or four, he would play against them. And therefore, if um, if there was um, an opinion uh, to add to what the technical staff would have seen in the first two or three Premier League games um, that season, then, then I thought it was our job to be able to do that. So um, not having... Uh, comparative to, to top Premier League clubs anyway, that necessarily the, the, the resources from a, a manpower point of view, um, we we try to um, uh, through various platforms like Wisecout, where you can access um, pretty much every game um, within 24 hours of it having been played. So there's, there really was no excuse, um, and there is no shortage of time uh, to be able to 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 look at all these players from uh, from far and wide, but still trying to make it relevant to uh, to our recruitment process, which is the most important thing. And uh, and it became it became obvious. Um, within a couple of seasons of having focused uh, our attentions um, internationally as well as domestically, 
um, that that Eddie and Jason liked um, players uh, from Spain. Um, they they liked the the Spanish way of playing. I think there was a lot of similarities between how um, our Bournemouth team played um, compared with a lot of La Liga teams. It's that sort of uh, that um, ball retention, um, heavy possession based, um, but you know a high a high level of technical um, ability as well to. Um, you know, to create and go forward, score goals, etc. So, so, so they particularly liked watching Spanish football, and and therefore, when you like watching a particular brand of football, it, it became becomes obvious that there's players in 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 that league that you like, and and that's where the only internationally based scout that we have uh, is based in Madrid. Um, it's not by accident, of course, and uh, and that's why um, two or three signings since then have have, have come from Spain. Um, and that was the, the. It was essentially me reacting, us reacting to 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 Eddie's likes and uh, and trying to cast that net net as as far and wide as feasible as well as possible. And uh, and if you again, uh, Eddie's level of detail and Jason's level of detail wouldn't be such that we would just take a punt on someone. We'd have to again produce a body of work um, to go along with a recommendation. And and you can only really do that if you if you've got sort of hands and feet on ground. And picking up sort of um, character references as well as as well as what your eyes can see on on a TV screen. You mentioned Y Scout. There, we'll move on to some supporters' questions towards the end. But Jamie has actually asked a question about Y Scout. First of all, he's not asking, but explain what Y Scout is. First of all, but he's saying to what degree are transfers based on various statistical models out there compared to the eye test surrounding specific players. Well, Wisecout first and foremost is uh, is, is a platform um, where it's if you haven't seen it, it's, it's incredible, really. I, mean, I still try and get my head around how they actually managed to make it work. Basically, the platform consists of uh, a plethora of flags on the uh, uh, on the homepage, and you click on uh, whatever flag it is, it opens up the the leagues of the of that country, uh, and then before you know it, you can be watching third division football in in mo- the most remote leagues uh, in in the world, and uh, Again, it's a bit of a nightmare for, for us in the recruitment department because suddenly there's no hiding places. So if you don't know a player, there's no excuse. You just haven't worked hard enough. And uh, and and Wisecout, kind of, within 24 hours, sometimes less, sometimes a little bit more. Um, every game that's played is um, I, I say every game. 99% of games um, that are played uh, have been there. They've been they've been clipped as well, so you can go on and just look at the events of a, a particular player. I actually have a little bit of fun going back historically and, and seeing how bad I was you know, going back and view events from my last uh, games in football, wondering why I wasn't given a contract uh, at the end of the season. And the answer is pretty obvious. Um, but uh, I, I like to watch a whole game and not necessarily just cut it to the events. But there's so much you can do with it. Um, and, and, and you can sort of watch a player's best actions, um, which is always a dangerous thing to do because clearly best actions are exactly that. And they're cutting out a lot of what happens in between. So you can be fooled and... Uh, Make anyone look good in a in a sort of a, a cameo of best actions, but that that's what Y Scout is, and I, I think an essential. I'm, I'm sure there are others out there, and perhaps uh, Y Scout should sponsor this uh, particular <laughs> session of uh, of this podcast. But uh, um, that's the platform we use, and it's, it's always been very good to us in that regard. Um, statistics, question of statistics, yeah, v- very interesting question, and uh, it's something that we've um, more than flirted with uh, at this football club in the last um, six years. Um, we at one point had uh, um, someone who, whose sole role it was at the club to um, crunch data um, achieved from Opta or obtained from Opta, um, and uh, and to to make that uh, personal and relevant to Bournemouth. Um, which uh, I'm trying to simplify it here, but it, it's someone a lot more intelligent than I, um, you know, devising an algorithm. Essentially, and and sort of getting comparative players to players that have been successful to us, or players that the manager has liked, um, always very useful. When particularly when it's a it's a league you can't get to uh, readily, so if uh, it can be your your first port of call uh, as well. So say for example, you don't have a uh, someone with um, hands and feet out in in Austria scouting, but the numbers may flag up Naby Keita, for example, when he was at uh, at Salzburg, and and suddenly you don't have to watch 50 odd games of the the Austrian um, Premier Division you can just focus in on that one player who, whose numbers are good and, and it, then it depends club to club um, and and we have always been uh, you know the eye the eye test essentially as I said before the managers got um, first and last say in terms of I want this player with this type of player and then in the end 
deciding whether the type of player that's been put in front of him is, is the one that he wants. Um, and and that in the body of work that goes in between, yes, stats play play a, a part. Um, uh, I, I wouldn't want to em- overemphasize the, the, the part that they played because it's it's interesting numerically to to sort of um, either confirm what you think you see or correct what you may have seen wrong. Um, and um, I'd, I'd say that it's something that um, we've always wanted to be progressive with, um, and uh, the incorporation of a data scientist one day into into recruitment department um, would be something that would be of uh, of huge interest to myself and recruitment coordinator Craig McKee um, because that will give us uh, more information and and anyone who who's blind to wanting more information or deaf to wanting to hear more information for me is not doing the job properly. (laughs) Um, We're going to come on to your playing career very shortly Rich which I know you'll be delighted about Um, but just before you mentioned there about um, going to watch players and and statistics and various others in the current COVID climate I I think I'm right in saying that scouts have certain rules by which is it the next two opponents you can go and watch matches so this is a two-part question one is just tell us how the restrictions at the moment affect what your department would do and secondly how do your recruitment department split up you touched on this earlier watching players for future signings and watching opponents for future games coming up. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, yeah, so, so you're absolutely right in terms of the scouts. Allowed. It's, it's, it's the next three games, the next three opponents um, rather than two, but absolutely, yes, um, that's the situation now. Um, the, the more experienced scouts, let's put it that way, have, find a way um, to, to know someone who knows someone who issues the tickets. At Seth. Again, I'm, I'm saying all this as someone might get in trouble from it. I'm sure we don't do it at this club, by the way. I think I'm sure we stick to the rules. But um, the, the, the scouts um, that, that we have uh, at this club are very adept at sort of it, and, and knowing when perhaps uh, not all of the next three opponents have taken up their allocation, and that's where it's possibly a question for the club secretary more than more than myself in terms of at what point are you allowed to reissue a ticket to someone else. So we have found ways as a department to 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 get into games. Um, it, in this season so yeah we'll focus on um so i mentioned earlier to neil that the 91 teams uh, that we have covered um we won't necessarily apportion any of that to opposition scouting so if we can go to the next um three opposition um next games of so the next three opponents games um then we will use that as a sort of recruitment scouting if you like uh, or traditional scouting um because um garvin stewart who heads up the opposition uh, analysis and, and, and the analyst side of things um, he and Ryan Dawes and, and their team, they, they do this most of it by computer. And in fact, the, the, the pictures that they get um, are not necessarily the sort of traditional TV screen, they're, they're sort of um, wide angled or, or high view. So being a game from an opposition um, perspective, I, I, my personal opinion, I realized pretty quickly how redundant that was um, because apart from the fact the manager has the ability to watch that team as many times as he wants on, on the computer. So he's not going to listen to someone else's opinion who was at the game and had a, a one without being able to rewind and pause and start again. So uh, you see them um, when, when people live on the ground, people like sort of literally writing down set pieces and what they're doing. And I wonder why they do it because, you know, every club, um, I'd, I'd imagine every club in the Football League will have um, you know analysts chopping up data on set pieces as well and, and, and going by the screen themselves. So I think those scouts that go to the game and actually waste the time taking a sort of a still picture of what's happening in the, on a corner is a waste of time, is my opinion. Um, so we, we've had to try and um, cope where we can, go to whatever games we can that are relevant, but also this is where uh, Scout again, sort of sponsoring them again. <laughs> and this is where it becomes more and more important that uh, uh, there are scouts that that, that believe that, um, that you can only, you can't sign a player without having seen them live. And whilst I, I subscribe to the sentiment, I didn't have to see Lionel Messi live to realize he was a good player. So it, it's if, if you watch people enough on other platforms, then you can definitely reach a an opinion of sorts. Clearly, it goes without saying you want sort of proper um, sort of eyes on the ground, and and you go you want to get to the stage where you're going to a game, watching a player to to see what he does when the opposition have a call. not actually taking in the game or the context around the game, but just focusing on that one player out of the twenty two. You want to get to a stage where that's how you're scouting a player, but it's not always possible and it's definitely challenging in this climate. Certainly sounds like scouting's moved on since uh, Willow. He'll tell me he used to drive to Middlesbrough, write the formation down on the back of a fag packet and maybe forget half the players. And I'm not doing him down by saying this is how he describes it back in the day. Signing players like me that way. That's <laughs> <right>. <laughs> um, Neil. Joe, I was just going to ask you, um, Richard, 
about your um, upbringing in Italy. Um, you were born in Glasgow, but you were raised in Italy. How 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 did that all come about? Um, so my my parents and my older brother were living in Milan at the time. My mum was expecting me, and um, uh, because she had just moved over to Italy from Glasgow, she didn't speak Italian, and she wasn't comfortable having a a baby. Even though that was the plan originally, she wasn't comfortable. Eventually, when it came around to uh, uh, to labour time or close to it, that she wasn't she wasn't uh, totally confident of uh, of being sort of barked orders by Italian doctors. So. Um, she came, uh, she went back to Glasgow, had me, and within a month um, we moved back over um, to join my, my dad and my brother. Um, so it was purely my dad's job that brought him there. He um, he worked for a publishing company, um, Penguin, um, a branch of Penguin, um, so distributing books for um, Italians learning English. So essentially it was uh, we were expats living in Milan. And um, it was it was clearly all I knew. Um, the upbringing was at a British school, so I did the British schooling system, um, and football was played for my originally my local teams. So it was sort of English in the house, English at school, Italian out the house, um, from a language and a cultural perspective. Um, and at the age of um, actually at the age of ten, I got um, uh, signed up by AC Milan, and um, I didn't want to go. I was a, a shy boy that um, clearly that that moving from a, a British way of, of living to an Italian culture was, was still quite tricky and confusing perhaps but uh, that's my excuse for turning down the, the opportunity of going to uh, AC Milan ridiculously at the age of 10 um, but I was fortunate that a year later uh, Atalanta who who if anything have and still do a, a, a better um, youth system um, picked me up from my local club and, and brought me in there when I was uh, um, a youth team player for seven years and just tell us about how important you speak Italian, you obviously speak English. How important has, has that skill been in your your role now? Yeah, language is clearly for communication. When um, it, It's a, the biggest attribute I think you can have or, or try to have in, in this uh, side of the fence is communication. And that, that that's internally and externally as well. It, it, it's trying to be uh, a good spokesman, a good ambassador for, for the football club. And um, given that at times, uh, definitely from a recruitment perspective, I will be the first, um, the first face, uh, the first voice that, that, that people hear from the football club. Um, if you can communicate in, in different languages, um, it, it clearly helps. Now, it would have helped more if the manager liked Italian football than, uh, than, than Spanish. But uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to uh, yeah, uh, sort of tailor my ways to, to theirs. And I actually did do one Spanish lesson and gave up after one just through <laughs> through time restrictions more than anything else. But yeah, I, I, I speak French as well. I, I did uh, French to, um, uh, to A level. Um, so it, that, that was, you know, it's come in handy a few times as well with uh, French speaking players and um, uh, and the scouting was um, we're quite heavily based in, in, in France um, after after promotion and uh, I can't think of any well Lise Mousset of course and Max Grader with the two recruits that spring to mind I don't think I'm forgetting anyone from from France but but clearly in that case in Lisa's situation uh, definitely with them um, with the family and his agent having the ability to, to speak to them in, in their mother tongue at times was uh, was clearly beneficial and how did you find your way to Arsenal because that's obviously where we signed you from yeah so um when I was, uh, well, got to the stage, I was 17, and, and uh, the awkward thing about Italian um, football at the time uh, was there was, apart from the fact there was a, a loophole in the regulations, and uh, Gennaro Gattuso had uh, just left, um, I think it was Salernitana or Perugia, I'm not sure which one, but he'd just left there and gone to Rangers and a loophole in the contract, so um, he wouldn't have been able to go to another Italian club, but to a British club. Uh, he went for next to nothing, and uh, and I always had that in the back of my mind that that's what I would try to do, only because... Um, it was uh, a situation where my, my schooling had come to an end. I'd done my A-levels. Uh, the Italian schooling system finished a year later than the British one. So um, lots of my, uh, all the, the, the boys my age at Atalanta at the time had another year's worth of studies to continue. So I got to the stage where my A-levels had finished. I was either going to have a pro contract playing football or I was going to go to university. Um, and if I'd have stayed in Italy, I'd have had to have waited 12 months uh, for a resolution to this. And um, um, so Arsenal, um, having, I, I assume, seen me play for Scotland under 18s at the time, and, uh, and Liam Brady, who was the head of, um, uh, of youth development at the time at Arsenal, uh, has his roots in Italy as well from his time at Sampdoria and Juventus. So he was, uh, 
he was he was keen to bring me to to Arsenal, and that's how it came about. And it was um, it, it happened pretty knowing what I know now, how unlikely the story was at the time. I can I only realise now at the time it was like, all right, okay, well, okay, I'll leave Atalanta, I'll go to Arsenal, and, and that's where my uh, how my career will, will pan out. And uh, I'd always wanted to come back to, but even though I I, I love everything about Italy, I love ninety ninety nine percent of things uh, in Italy, um, and from a footballing perspective, I owe all my education, of course, to, to the Italian way of playing. Um, I'd always had a fascination of, of, of playing football over here, and it was maybe some of the passion and the, and the crowds. Um, uh, because growing up in the 80s and 90s in Italy, even though um, people fo uh, focused on hooliganism over in, in the UK, but believe me, it was in the stadiums, it was rife in, in Italy at the time, and there was something quite intimidating about the, the Italian uh, match day um, situation whereas in England I think post um, post Hillsborough perhaps things had, had moved in a in a more friendly family orientated manner or at least that's what seemed to me that, uh, as a Scot growing up in in Milan so I always had this this dream and vision that I would come back and play in in the UK and that's how it turned out. So then obviously Big Willow's shown Mel Mach in the back of your the, your name on the back of a fag packet and you signed <laughs> here just tell us about your first impressions of what you saw. Yeah that that, that was quite an interesting one uh, um, at the uh, I spent a year at Arsenal um, reserves, uh, and and like lots of footballers, completely deluded to the fact that I, um, um, thinking I was better than I was, and wondering how I couldn't oust people like Petit and Vieira from Arsenal's first team. And this was just a joke. I, I should be playing in this in this double winning Arsenal team. So you get a little bit. Um, I got a, a bit frustrated and disillusioned that the first team seemed like a, a mirage, which it sh should have been with the players that we had there. Um, so the opportunity came to come and talk to Mel Machen uh, at the end of my, uh, as it transpired, only season at Arsenal, even though I had a, a two-year contract. And um, when I came to talk to Mel, um, one of my first questions uh, to him, or my father's question, my father was, um, other than my father, was also my agent at the, at the time, um, which is something he did for five or six years. And, um, and we asked Mel where he saw me play because I, I'd actually, in Italy, I had, uh, uh, I had, played at left back, I played centre back before, I played central midfield and um, and he told me he wanted me to play left back but when I come to Arsenal um, I, I came as a left back and then they had a pretty decent left back in the youth team called Ashley Cole so I was ousted from that position thrust into midfield um, and uh, so I, I, I thought that this country would only know me as a central midfielder when I asked Mel that question he said he wanted me to play as a, as a left back um, and I, I sort of scratched my head and I was like well, when when would you have seen me play left back? And he goes at Southampton and Southampton reserves. And I was like, and I was like, oh, I remembered that we had an injury during the game, and I went to play left back for five minutes. And uh, and I was like, I said that to me. I was like, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, the Southampton. Yeah, I played there for five minutes. And he looked at me, and I, then I got to know Mel, and I know he's deadly serious. He goes, you played well for five minutes, son. <laughs> <laughs> so there was it. It was back of a fact paper, fact paper, and five minutes worth of uh, football that that earned me. Um, a four-year contract to Bournemouth and a lifetime of happiness. It's, it's an interesting story about the left-back. Uh, another player who will remain nameless told me a story once about Mel. Said to him after a game, you played left-back today, son, and you, you weren't very good. With which the player turned around to him and said, well, why did you play me there then? <laughs> <laughs> a valid question. <laughs> Major debut August 98 alongside Eddie and JT. Played 56 games in your first season. Do you, what can you remember about that? Nowadays, that would be unheard of, wouldn't it? I can remember having a hernia at the end of the season and having an operation that saw me the, <laughs> out the whole of the next one. It's, it's. Um, yeah, I just loved it. Uh, I loved. Um, it, it was quite daunting um, coming. It, it was a new country essentially to me. I'd only been in the UK for a year, uh, and I'm suddenly um, in my second year of being in the UK. I'm having to be uh, okay. I was an adult. I was 19 at the time, but living my own fend for myself, um, all things that, uh, that that at the time I probably took for granted, but it, it was quite quite a challenge. Um, and amongst that, trying to forge a way in, in, in this career um, that I had decided to, to embark in. And, uh, but, but I love the, 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 the feeling of results mattering at the, at the end of the day was, uh, was um, something that I, I knew I wanted, but I wasn't quite ready for going to play. So that, that season, you know, there's so many games that I remember. I remember that Lincoln uh, City debut. Um, I remember the Wolves um, winning the cup uh, a couple of months later at Molyneux. Um, 
uh, one of my most enjoyable seasons uh, I've had. I thought we were such a good team um, that, that season, a team that was very unlucky not to to reach the playoffs. I thought we were easily one of the best teams in the league in, in, at a time where there were some really good teams, weren't they, in, in, in the league and uh, the likes of Manchester City and, and, and Stoke. Uh, for example, big clubs that had just dropped down, and um, and I really enjoyed it, um, and uh, ultimately ended in disappointment with a sort of pretty bland nil-nil draw at home to to Wrexham on the last day of the season, um, where we we like the last five or six games we we sort of ran out of steam a little bit, and uh, uh, and that was that. But there were other great teams at, at Bournemouth. The one a couple of years after that one, of course, the the, the Jermaine Defoe team, um, but probably and and. and I don't know if Eddie and Jason will thank me for saying this because they were obviously two uh, fantastic teammates um, in that four-year stint that I had at the club first time around. But the changing room I enjoyed most was when I came back and um, and, and and that team that uh, we got promotion uh, that season from League One, uh, coming second, and then the first season in the Championship until until I retired. Um, uh, but that was the, that was probably my my happiest year in football that that season. We we came up from League One and and that's even taking into account all the, the, the good times I had down there all the Portsmouth as well in between Just, just going back to um, 1998 um, Eddie Jason both in the team was a really good team Mark Steen Ian Cox Steve Robinson Steve Fletcher and the late Mark Ovendale someone I know that you were very close to Yeah Mark was um, Mark was great um, with me when I first arrived he was uh, he was a big kid but he was uh, he was a proper adult he was in his mid-twenties and he had a family uh, and he took me under his wing um, when I arrived here because I was sort of on my own and um, plenty of good friends. But um, uh, Mark, uh, easily um, one of the closest and um, just just uh, a, a great goalkeeper as well. I mean, it, part of the reason that we were such a good good team that year um, was because Mark was uh, was just so good, you know. And uh, and that was probably moving up from youth team football to reserve team football and then reserve team football to first team football. That's what I really noticed. Uh, you know the difference because you're suddenly playing with a man in goal, who, whose whose goal coverage was uh, was excellent, um, and um, yeah, and, and an altogether great person. Um, I think it was only it was only a couple of seasons he was before he got signed by Luton. Um, or was it at the end of that season? Neil, was it one and a half? Sorry, I can't I quite remember. Ca catching you off guard there, but uh, he was. Um, uh, Mark was a great teammate, a great friend, um, and um, yeah, someone I remember very fondly indeed. And his son's playing in the Wessex League for Brockenhurst now and doing, doing very well for people who don't know. You, you, you spoke about one or two flirts with the playoffs, none more so than 2000, 2001. The Jermaine season, which, believe it or not, 20 years ago was when he went on that amazing run of 10 in a row. Yeah, I mean, that, that was... Again, another good team, uh, really good team. And we were third from bottom, I think, um, uh, before Jermaine came in on loan. Um, Eddie Howard tries to say that it was it culminated with his return uh, from injury at the same time. And they both made their, uh, their come... Well, Eddie made his comeback at Stoke and Jermaine made his debut at Stoke. Uh, we could beat 2-1 because someone missed a penalty again. And uh, that was me. And uh, and uh, but, but it was a really good team and, um, and a team that... Um, I can't quite explain how we didn't manage to, to to see that game out at Reading. It would be one of the most mysterious games I've, I've played. Perhaps a little bit of um, uh, maybe too much youth, if anything, in a, a time like that with 3-1 up with um, 10, 50 minutes to go. And then Eddie Howe and Jason Tindall get themselves into a tangle and give away a free kick in the edge of the box. And, uh, and their 3-2 with 10 minutes to go just uh, was a little bit too much for us to, to call. But Stephen Petrus should have scored, actually, to make it 4-3 thereafter when he hit the crossbar. But it was... Um, if we'd have got if we'd have got into the playoffs with that team, we came seventh in the end. Then we missed out by by that by that goal. Uh, if we'd have got into the playoffs, I think that's why Reading were sort of so uh, treated treated it so seriously. I think they were third in the league at the time, so they would have played us. Don't think they'd have enjoyed that. I think Jermaine would have would have found his way to put them through the sword again, and we'd have got to the to the championship. But uh, as it transpired, we had to wait um, nine years. Yeah, I'll just add you to my list of all the people that. Taking the credit for Jermaine's ten goals, that Steve Fletcher, Wade Elliott, both <laughs> said that they supplied them all. <laughs> I think you'll find that his great goal at Oxford that he scored—you know that one where he dinked his keeper—I get an assist for that for passing it to him on the edge of a own box. So uh, <laughs> Fletch can take all the credit he wants, but uh, that was my assist on that one. The best goal I've ever seen live for us was that very goal on Boxing Day. It was he chipped the goalkeeper, and the goalkeeper was virtually on his line. Yeah, but more about the assist. The assist was a good one, wasn't it? <laughs> 
Now, I've just got to quickly touch on your disciplinary record here. 37 yellow cards and two reds. That's almost Harry Arter-esque, isn't it? Um, <laughs> well, actually, unlike Harry, a good friend of mine, um, most of my yellow cards were actually wisely taken. Uh, I think um, I, I always, and this is part of my, I guess, upbringing in the game, I always went, went into a game thinking that the yellow card wasn't a negative. You're allowed one of them. And uh, depending on the position you play, and as a defensive midfielder, um, and at times a tough tackling midfielder, I, I would think that um, I was allowed to get one yellow card just as long as I didn't get two of them in the same game. And, and the sending offs for Bournemouth would have been, oh, well, yeah, one was in my second my penultimate game for the club um, where the manager played me with a knee injury and I couldn't really move. Um, but uh, um, the first one was against QPR at Loftus Road, which I thought was a really harsh double yellow. I think I, I, I got the ball in that case. But my disciplinary... Uh, record, as I say, differentiating it uh, between myself and uh, and those who who may get a yellow card or two for shouting at the referee, I I, I save them for incidents that actually help the team. That was my uh, that's my excuse for that. You left at the end of two thousand and one, two thousand and two, for Portsmouth. Warren Feeney, James Hayter, Carl Fletcher, Wade Elliott all went on to play in the Championship. A really good team. Surely that team was too good to go down. Do you think? Uh, yes. Yes, it was. Uh, and again, something I can't put my finger on uh, quite what happened. I think injuries played a large part uh, in that. Um, and uh, whilst not being able to recollect, funnily enough, of all the seasons, I've managed to forget the ones that didn't go well. So I'm trying to, I'm racking my brain for that one. Um, I, I do know that I was injured a lot, I'm not saying that, uh, that there were other injuries as well. Uh, and of course, Eddie left in, in March, which was a big, uh, big loss um, to us for the, for the remainder of the season. Um, but yeah, that was um, yeah, no, no reason for it. Um, it was um, I think that the sort of uh, the basis of that team ended up sort of fighting its way back from um, from the league below, didn't as well. So they, they proved that they were sort of too good to go down. Um, but yeah, it, it, of all the, of the four years that I had first time around, funnily enough, that's that's the one that sort of I I can't remember as uh, as well as the others. Just going back to Sean O'Driscoll, the man who was the manager at that time, obviously. Chris and I both had our difficulties and differences dealing with him from a media point of view. Richard, but every single ex-player you speak to about him has nothing but high praise for him as a manager. But years ahead of his time, some have said. Yeah, very much so. I, I, I thought um, the fact that, that, that so many people that were part of that team that Sean had are still involved in the game in some capacity and not necessarily always in managerial um, positions or coaching positions, but um, in no small part because Sean invited a group of young players to think about the game differently to to think outside the box and uh, and you didn't do you didn't go through a session um f just for the sake of it and um lots of lots of sessions that i've had a, a, had as a professional footballer in the, in the 16 years um would, would have fitted that build they would have you know just a means for getting through the week and, and playing a game at the end of it whereas sean actually invited everyone to think and there, there was no there was no way you could sort of relax out there. You were always learning. It was an education. Um, he was a, a a proper coach, a teacher almost of, of the game, um, and uh, and he was he was mild mannered, very sort of placid. Um, so there was nothing not to like from from a player's perspective um, for him. He was uh, definitely not a, a, a teacup thrower or anything like that. So as a young player, you wanted someone that sort of would educate you rather than chastise you when when things weren't going right um and uh and uh, yeah what you guys experienced in the media i mean he, he was probably he, he didn't give the the cliche answer that people expected as well he, he if there was a question asked of him he wanted to uh, to give it, and some sometimes that ended up with him talking in riddles. But, you know, it wasn't as if we, we, and you've got to find the next question. Whereas we've just got to get on with kicking a ball around afterwards. And it was sometimes that uh, I remember well that he would maybe stop a training session and say there was the, the orange bibs against the yellow bibs, and he's like, "Who's in control?" He'd stop it, get everyone together. Who's in control? And it's like everyone quiet. Some would go oranges, and he go no. Some of the yellow bibs would go yellows. He goes no, neither of you. So so the answer was always a cryptic one. With Sean, and that was uh, that, that was something that I think uh, was very useful to to all of us that we embraced it and we and we did think more. I've got to say the same actually applies. I've always said to people actually working with Sean as a journalist back then is when I started my career. I was very wet behind the ears. Some would say I still am, um, but if you ask Sean a bad question, he'd, he'd let you know. So if, if I asked him a closed question, he'd say yes or no. 
Like as in, and then you're like, okay, well, I need to be a lot better here. One sticks in my mind at Brentford, and I don't remember if you know if you remember the game when Neil Young kicked Stephen Hunt up in the air and got sent off. And I said to Sean, have you been to speak to the referee about his performance? And he just said, you go and speak to him. And it was just one of those interviews where I think you were next to me, Neil, weren't you that day? It's funny enough, I didn't go to that game, Chris, but I, I remember one when Marcus Browning um, missed a couple of penalties or missed, certainly missed one penalty here. And in the press room after the game, Steve Wilson, an ex-colleague of ours, said, um, how's Marcus Browning feeling in the changing room there, Sean? Well, he's a grown man with kids. <laughs> ask, ask him yourself. Is he from Yorkshire? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, they, you, you, there's a number of those those examples. There are. But, yeah, no, but fundamentally great. And actually, it's a bit of a segue because Sean's obviously been working in the youth setup at Portsmouth, hasn't he, uh, in recent times. Just a quick reflection on your Pompey career in, in one answer, Rich. Um, the two most notable achievements, winning the FA Cup and getting Cristiano Ronaldo sent off. <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a poor career when that's your biggest uh, claim to fame, isn't it? I'm, I'm, my, my son, who was... Uh, He's only five, so he, he clearly did, well, he didn't see me play, let alone back then. And uh, and uh, he can't quite get his head around, uh, no pun intended, that Cristiano Ronaldo <laughs> introduced his head to mine. Um, and uh, yeah, that that I would take away the FA Cup, you know, Chris. It's not, I, I say that to people because I, I wasn't in the matchday squad that won it. I wasn't in the matchday squad that won the semi-finals, even though I played the, the rounds up until then. And I don't know where my, my FA Cup winner's medal is, to be honest. And it's not something that I feel that I achieved. I, I, I genuinely don't think. I think my... Um, my biggest moment in Portsmouth was when we played against uh, AC Milan in the, in the UEFA Cup because it tied a lot of things together. As someone who'd grown up in, in Milan and watched the great AC Milan teams play as a season ticket holder back in the 80s and, uh, and 90s and, uh, and, and to have the opportunity of playing against them in European football, which is my, my pinnacle and international football isn't. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like international football, but um, the international um, club competitions that I love very much and... Uh, and to have that, that opportunity to play in, in an unbelievable night, a night that even Portsmouth fans who have been um, lifelong fans look back on that day as one of their highlights, and, and it certainly was for me in my career. And I was there that night. That would be, yeah, I was. And I still can't believe you didn't win. No, n n neither can I. I, was, I went from being absolutely devastated that we didn't win, cause clearly to, to sort of um, uh, to really sign off and your, your finest footballing um, moment with a win would have been would have been the pinnacle. But you know, there's something that... Um, I find that I quite like now the fact that the reason we didn't win is because Ronaldinho scored an unbelievable Ronaldinho style, style free kick and uh, Philippe Winzaghi did what he did um, for years and years um, and broke records uh, internationally for doing so by scoring a scruffy equaliser in the 93rd minute. So if you're going to not win, let it be those, those two things that, that stopped us. We've taken up a lot of your time, Richard, already, and we're just going to wind up. We've got a few fans' questions to finish with. One, just a couple of other ones I wanted to put at you before we get to that. Um, just touching back very briefly on the recruitment. Um, obviously, just in this uh, recent couple of months, you've made what, £80 million in fees on players, which is probably about a £55, £60 million profit. Um, the club's recruitment has taken a bit of a, a bit of a battering down the years in terms of some expensive signings that maybe haven't quite worked out as well as people hoped. Do you feel criticism from those who don't really know the the ins and outs of how all of this comes together? Do you think sometimes that's a bit unfair? Um, perhaps so, but that's because I'm invested into thinking that. I, I think it's um, it, it's one of the, the the elements of the industry where everyone has an opinion, right? Because not everyone can have uh, the, the brains of a mass, master tactician. Not everyone can play football to the levels that they wanted to. Not everyone has a degree or a, or the expertise in sports science to really know that element of the game. We can all have an opinion on the players. We can all have an opinion on, on the transfer window. I mean, there's, there's broadcasting companies have made a lot of money and... Um, advertising around it because it is something that sort of people want to know about and people want to have an input in so i would never criticize people for having an opinion we all have it even if it's not recruitment that directly involves the club that we're involved in or support i, I do think that working this side of the fence i think you have to be uh you have to accept the fact that you don't know all the elements that go into the equation of determining whether something is good bad or indifferent um, there are plenty of examples down to, to cite one Aston Villa when they got relegated from the Premier League um, going back would have been five years ago now and, and their recruitment came under fire but actually in that recruitment the, the Idris Agui um, w was signed the Damatrore who even though he wasn't played at the time is now of course more than a household name and Jordan Veritu is running the midfield for Roma so these were three signings and two of them were uh, in Veritu and Traore's case were, uh, were deemed a failure but in the end, it wasn't the right time at the right club with the right people, perhaps. Uh, 
in in terms of uh, of a own um a own situation i think that sometimes people may forget that uh in an evolution that the club has gone under in the last um, six years, definitely post-promotion from Championship to Premier League. I touched on it earlier that the average age of the team that, that got promoted meant that eventually we would have to recruit and replace. Um, and um, at some stages last season, Eddie Howe was, uh, or even the season before actually, Eddie Howe was naming a, a team full of Eddie Howe signings, no longer were there any of the lads that, that, that perhaps he had inherited. So. When you're doing that at the sharpest end uh, in the sharpest league in the world, it, it's always a challenging situation. You, you, you're clearly going to have to recruit more. Therefore, by, uh, by pure statistics and numbers, you, there are going to be ones that are uh, not necessarily successful because you're not, no one's going to get 100% right. So even some people say if you get two out of three right, you're doing well. And, and, and if you're signing um, 20 players, then forgive me, I've got no calculator in front of me, but... So one third of 20 could potentially be a failure and it still be, generally speaking, a, a success. Um, and, um, and and then also the, the, the exact chemistry needed um, at a club like ours, um, where uh, a team that functioned so well uh, for such a number of years and to break into that team is, is very difficult. Um, and um, But, but I, I don't look, I don't personally don't look at it as a, um, as a, anything but over the piece successful because otherwise we wouldn't have stayed in in the Premier League for for as long as we have otherwise we wouldn't have had um, a team that's very competitive in the championship now if, if the recruitment hadn't been um, more bad than good that's just my opinion Chris so it's not it's not one that uh, I, th I think the most misleading stat out there and that's something that perhaps um, more of the uh, the media nationwide rather than the people actually who know what's going on at the football club and the fans it was a statistic where our net spend was as high as it was. And, and that was a particularly annoying uh, stat for, for me to sort of try and tell everyone that how misleading it was because um, actually I think I haven't seen that. Um, funnily enough, I haven't seen that table um, since uh, 80 million pound sales, but I think it'd be, we might find ourselves below Bayern Munich and Barcelona and Liverpool <laughs> now. Um, but that was always a, um, a misleading one just because of the level of investment that had to have been made um, to make us uh, competitive uh, and the fact that um, not until recently were we able to sort of um, prove that some of those assets were, were worth um, not only more than what we had bought them for but a sufficient amount to readdress that imbalance which that league table had us on um, yeah just before we get to the fans ones Neil you've got a couple you want to sneak in I just want to ask you that European adventures that you had with Portsmouth involved some flying Rich just tell us about your uh you're not a keen flyer, is that fair to say? I'm totally cured now. Totally cured, and <laughs> I am. I'm fine now. But during my playing playing days, I was I was really bad, and uh, I don't know what happened. It was just being on too many flying caravans up and down the country and getting battered around in the wind. And then I was like, "Well, why am I doing this? I'm risking." My I felt like I was risking my life every time we had an away game. And uh, uh, but it, especially when we went to uh, Europe, where um, I was in my height of my fear, and. Um, and uh, yeah, that that wasn't easy. But um, we went to Portugal twice, I think, and and uh, and Germany once. And, and Germany was a particularly bad adventure uh, because it took some doing to get me on the plane. And Tony Adams was a manager at the time, and and he didn't even get on the plane. He he sort of went train both ways. Um, but when we got to the, the airport, I think we were in Hanover. We played Wolfsburg away, and we were in Hanover Airport after the game. And as a, as anyone who's fearful of flying will know, you're, you're sort of listening out to everything. And David James is trying to get me to play cards, and I'm not really interested. I want to know what that sound is and why that light's doing that. Um, and then smoke started filling in the, the cabin, so I'm like seatbelt off, and I'm like right down to the front. We haven't obviously we we hadn't left the runway yet. It, was, it <laughs> wasn't uh, um, completely breaking rules, and I was like, look, I, I need to get out. This, and they're like, yeah, yeah, no, no. Uh, pilot's just going to make an announcement as like ir irrespective of what the announcement is <laughs> open the door <laughs> i'm out um and i was wondering why i was the only one kicking up a fuss and uh i was at jermaine defoe was equally bad at flying and uh and looked at the back of the plane jermaine had big headphones in and was oblivious to the smoke having sort of filling the cabin i made a mistake of telling alerting jermaine to what was happening and he was scrambling he was trying to get in out in front of me uh in the end we didn't fly um but the the next day we um we were told there'd been a, a change of aircraft uh, and uh, Sam, um, lovely lady in charge of the travel, uh, just pulled me aside before we got on the plane and said, look, they've, they've asked me to tell you it's a different plane, but I'm not going to do that. It's the same plane, but they fixed the problem. I'm like, Sam, I was down at Hertz rent-a-car. <laughs> <laughs> I 
and me and Jermaine had uh, our own version of uh, trains, planes, and automobiles <laughs> back from northern Germany. Um, one one final question about your playing career, Richard. Uh, seven years ago, you made your final appearance. Do you miss playing? Not at all. No, not at all. Uh, it's. I think what I when I was lucky that I had a year that I'd um, not played the game. Um, essentially, which was um, forced retirement after a contractual dispute at Portsmouth, and I didn't necessarily see it uh, ending the way it did. I, I, I thought people would pick up the phone and uh, and sort of offer me a contract when I was 32 at the time, uh, just on the back of having seven or eight years in the Premier League and one in the Championship. So I perhaps naively thought that, that I would still be in some uh, degree of demand, but I wasn't. So I ended up out of the game for a year. Um, and then when the, the phone rang 12 months later, uh, it was Paul Groves who'd um, managed me at um, at Grimsby originally. He was a player manager there, and he asked me not necessarily making the association of my um, my my link down here and the fact that even in my Portsmouth days I'd still lived in Bournemouth, and asked me if I'd come back. He said he had a really talented group of young players and he just needed um, one or two experienced players to go with it. And even though I didn't fancy it, if I'm honest, at the time I just thought I'd. I'd, I'd I bugged my um, my girlfriend, now wife, so much about how was it possible that someone as talented as me is watching Gillette Soccer Saturday every week at the age of 32 that uh, I jest about the talented bit, of course. But I, I thought it was, uh, and, and she said, well, you've bond enough about it for a year and someone's asked you, you go and do it. So I, I did it and um, essentially the rest is, is history and that's uh, I was obviously very grateful I did. Okay, which we're going to get some of the fans' questions to finish off with. Um, a couple of which we've already sort of answered in roundabout ways. So, for example, thanks to uh, to Shiv Mika, Eddie Mercer, Boscom St. John's on the social media who have asked questions that we've pretty much already answered and uh, the AFCB fan page as well about COVID. Um, Jack Wilson asks, who has been the most difficult signing to get across the line since you took on the recruitment uh, position? Um Actually, it was, um, it, it's not a signing that went too well. Um, it was uh, Juani Turbe. Um, and the reason for it being so difficult is um, apart from the fact that, that Juan and his entourage didn't speak any English at all and uh, that's what we were saying earlier Neil about how important it was to speak languages Juan was actually at Watford's training ground at, at the time and uh, I'd flown over to, uh, to to Roma to try and convince Roma that we were a better fit than um, than Watford for, for Juan's services till the end of the season and um, the Roma sporting director already had an agreement with them um, uh, what for its people who of course are Rudinese as well so there was all sorts of politics involved and uh, and it was trying to convince Juan and his agent that um that that we were better suited um to him um Watford obviously clearly wrong in the end because it, it, it didn't go it didn't go as well as uh, as we'd envisaged but in terms of difficulty about getting a deal done and it just shows you know the difficulty of getting a deal done doesn't necessarily guarantee success I mean this was a player that had, uh, had signed from um FC Porto as it was he had a, he was unknown from Porto to Verona and had a, an unbelievable season at Verona he, he was um Serie A's one of Serie A's best players easily and um and uh, at the end of that season um Verona had a an option to buy uh exercised it obviously because they were going to um, flip one on to either Juventus or Roma who had um who, who were both desperate for to sign him for I think it was 25 million euros at the time and the fact that Roma uh, saw off Juventus in that competition led to in part to Antonio Conte leaving the club uh, Juventus because he was questioning if, if we can't even win the battle domestically to sign the best players what chance have we got to to conquer internationally that was one of his quotes at the time when he left Juventus and uh, so clearly he was a player 25 million euros signed from, from Roma who'd fended off Juventus to sign him and a year and a half on we could get him on loan uh, it was you know it, w- it was a difficult one and that clearly to get over the line but uh Juan was a great guy, um, really, really good person. Um, so it was, you know, it was just a shame that it, it didn't work out. In terms of, uh, I, I said to people afterwards, I could be in this industry till I'm uh, greyer and older, and uh, and I don't think there'll be anything quite as complicated as that one. Will Partridge on social media asks, what one thing about the club's immediate future are you the most excited about? I think the amount of um, uh, of talent that we have in 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 the squad. I, I think in the in a day and age that we're in now well documented said COVID a lot of time before it's it's not it's not an ideal time for for watching football is it let's be honest it's the, it's a pretty pretty soulless situation playing in empty stadiums and uh, I think uh, I could be excited about two things the one thing I think it's just perhaps resonated clearly if anyone needed it how important fans are to the game um, and when when we do manage to to get to a time where fans are allowed back 
Uh, I can't see a time where they'd ever, if they ever were, but in situations where they were taken for granted that that will never happen again. Um, and um, from a Bournemouth perspective, so therefore focusing what we can control, and that's what, you know, the actual the football that's happening on the pitch. Um, the fact that we've, um, the transfer window closed this summer with still so many uh, talented players at the club, um, a, a team that's um, ho hopefully going to be very competitive, has already been competitive in the first seven games of this season and I think there's a lot more to come from us as well um, and um, I think we saw with the, 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 the sale of the three players this summer that finally um, a readdressing of the circumstances where the, the, an acknowledgement that there is talent in this uh, in this squad and the three players that the, that went um, in, in Nathan's case um, to, to one of the, the very very best um, I think that just shows the pathway is there um, and sort of completes um, the journey of um, <clears throat> scouting and recruitment at this club where the vision of um, having players come here, uh, giving them a real pathway, playing for, for a really good uh, really good club, uh, really well managed and coached, uh, and then to progress them on to, to playing for the very best. And I think there's there's plenty of players in there that uh, will have seen what's happened this summer and will, will want to achieve that themselves. But most importantly for us, they help us get back to the Premier League. Just like to say, Chris, that um, we'd like to urge people to get their questions in for the next podcast. I'm not quite sure who it's going to be yet, but as and when the time comes around, feel free to get on social media and get some questions sent in to us. Like Boscombe St. John's lad is asking your most memorable match you played in for Bournemouth. I've got to say, you haven't seen these, you haven't seen these questions in advance either, so we're putting you right on the spot. And I want to give a, a, a good answer as well, so I'm, I'm going to think about it. Um, uh, for a, I mean, memorable obviously um, allows for it to be negative as, as well as positive, I'm afraid. And, uh, and that Reading game that I described earlier, I mean, I can p replay that in my mind uh, as often as I like because it was, uh, it, it was such a good team performance and um, but ended up um, not the way we wanted it to do. Uh, so memorable for the wrong reasons. Memorable. I thought the transfer window was shut there. Was <laughs> is that mine? And it is an agent, lo and behold. I will be calling David back. <laughs> Sorry for that. Um, so so a, a, a season, a, a game that went well. I'd like to pick a, a game that went well. Obviously, from a memorable point of view, I can't lie to you, you know, that, that Reading game sticks out because it's a bit of a what if for me because I think we'd have got into the championship if, uh, if we'd have won that game. Um, I mentioned the Wolves winning the cup, but a win against West Brom in 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 the FA Cup was also um, an important moment. Um, oh God, let me pick my first goal. When a three three uh, draw at home to Gillingham, and my first goal in professional football, um, a, a surreal. I can envisage it now, um, and uh, a goal past uh, my former teammate and former uh, Bournemouth goalkeeper himself, and Vince Bartram, um, who was a teammate of mine at Arsenal. Um, and that, that's memorable for so many reasons because it was a, 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 it's a dream come true for any child sort of wanting to, to grow up and play football to scoring a goal in front of fans that means something. I'll go for the 3-3 three, three draw at home to Gillingham. It's a dream come true as a Gillingham fan, which I could imagine for anyone to score against Gillingham. Is that is that what you aim for? You... Changed, Chris, if I'd remembered, I would have changed it then. It was, uh, yeah, you ended up getting to the playoff final and it, how did that go for you against Man City? Well, let's talk about the following year, shall we? <laughs> come on, Levy Wigan. <laughs> um, just, but Neil, before you come on to your last one, actually that segues into Chris Hubble's um, question, which is what is the favourite goal of your career? Is that the same answer or is that a different one? Your favourite goal? No, my favourite goal was, um, uh, was one of... Only a couple of scored for Portsmouth, and it was a meaningful goal. And we knocked Liverpool out the uh, FA Cup, and uh, um, a sort of um, another surreal moment. Not someone who scored a lot of goals, and I would have scored more if I'd scored a, a few of the penalties I missed down the years. When I knew was see you thinking away in the back. Do you know I wasn't going to go there? No, no. But uh, <laughs> what about the other players who let me take them? Steve Fletcher, Eddie Howe, Jason Tindall. They were all on the same team. If they were man enough to step up that, and take them. The, the baton was shared around by so many players, and eventually Steve Robinson had quite a good record, I think. Yes, Robbo was particularly particularly good. Um, but I didn't score a lot of goals in my career, so definitely as a consequence, not too many meaningful ones. And that that Liverpool goal. Um, sorry to not have put a Bournemouth uh, sort no, of right. tinge to point. to the uh, to answer that question, but uh, it was a one 0 win and and the goal against um, such a, a top team was was clearly memorable. Right, last one, Rich. Um, a humorous one to finish with. Uh, now that you hang around in directors' boxes more than anything else at match days, of course, prawn sandwich, your best Italian food, or neeps and tatties. I oh, know it's, it's got to be the Italian food. It's not even close. I said I said earlier that 99% uh, of uh, everything Italian that I love and miss, 
uh, and food is uh, right front and center of that. So much so that we, uh, um, myself and my brothers, um, started up a couple of Italian restaurants in London, um, which are obviously hit by hard times at the minute. But uh, uh, that was a, a passion and another dream come true to to sort of uh, bring Italian food in some capacity to to England. So it's a, it's an easy answer there. Well, that has been uh, an absolutely fascinating, what, best part of well over an hour, Richard. We've uh, we've had you here as the uh, the first guest on the official AFC Bournemouth podcast. It's probably realised for you, I'm sure, how much you miss being interviewed back from your playing days and things, isn't it? Sitting here facing the questions. Well, not all the interview uh, interviewers are as talented as, as you two, gentlemen. I'll, I'll end with the loving that you two started off with at the time, and it's, it's been a real privilege to be your first guest. You've given Y Scout such a good plug there, but you haven't mentioned the name of your restaurant. Uh, it's a good. Re- it's closed because of COVID. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's been a true pleasure, I'm sure, for everyone listening, Richard, uh, both uh, from Bournemouth fans and maybe football fans generally, to hear not only the insights behind some of the stuff at the club here that people don't realise, but also from from your career as well. So, from myself and Neil, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure, Richard. My pleasure indeed. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Neil. <laughs> So that was our first guest here on the brand new official AFC Bournemouth podcast. Neil, what a cracking way to start. Absolutely fascinating, wasn't it? And the fact that he scored against Gillingham, what what a line that was. I love any player who scores against Gillingham, Chris, because every time we used to go there, we used to get battered. I'll be making sure that bit gets edited out so no one knows what you're talking about, in fact. Um, it's fantastic to hear from the, uh, I guess, the upper echelons of the club. Sometimes, you know, we don't hear maybe as much as fans would like sometimes. So from that point of view, it's good to hear some of the processes as well behind a lot of the stuff that myself and you, we've been knocking around this this club and this game for quite a while and lots of parts of the process that even we wouldn't know about. Well, it's like, like Richard said, you know, 20, 25 years ago, you know, most clubs maybe, maybe, maybe had one scout or two scouts and how it's developed and... In, in, with the internet and watching all these games that they can watch all the time as well without having to go anywhere and got scouts in foreign countries and scouts watching the youth teams and stuff like that. That was all fascinating stuff and giving us a real insight. It's going to be a real hard act to follow, but we're certainly going to be doing our best to make sure that we, we can. Absolutely, yes. This is the first of a brand new series here on the official AFC Bournemouth podcast. Don't forget to mention, mention us on our social media channels as well. Maybe ideas for future guests, people you'd like to hear from, what you want to see. Make sure you include the hashtag AFCBpod as well to suggest not only future guests, but also when you see the uh, the new guest advertised, make sure you send us your questions. This ultimately is for you guys, so please do let us know what you want to hear. Don't forget to subscribe to wherever you're listening right now to the pod as well. You can check out all the club updates on the website afcb.co.uk and you'll be able to find out when you can listen of course to the next edition of the official AFC Bournemouth podcast and of course in the meantime you can watch all of the games all of the championship action live on AFCB TV live if you haven't found out yet how to do that details on the website as well but for myself Chris Temple Neil Perry and our guest Richard Hughes it's goodbye for now (laughs) 